Greetings and welcome to the introduction to astronomy. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about compact stars. These are things like white dwarfs and neutron stars and what happens when they occur in a binary system. Now we've looked at white dwarfs and neutron stars separately, but some very interesting thing happens when they are part of a companion system. So let's go ahead and get started. So we've looked at the individual stars. But what happens when one of these is in a binary system? Now these are things that can happen. They don't mean they always will happen. But we will look at things like the novae and the supernovae and then X-ray and gamma ray bursts as different things that can happen when compact stars have a companion star. So let's start off with the novae. What happens with a white dwarf? We have a white dwarf star in a binary system. If the stars are close enough together. Now if they're far apart, nothing will happen and it will just sit there as normal. However, sometimes when the star expands, the ordinary star expands and becomes a red giant, it will end up being close enough that material is pulled from one star to another and begins to form an accretion disk around the white dwarf. Now the material in the outer layers of the star is hydrogen. So hydrogen builds up on the surface of the white dwarf star here. And that process continues until the temperature gets high enough that nuclear fusion starts on the surface of the white dwarf. So instead of nuclear fusion at the center of a star, here we have it happening on the surface and the star will suddenly become hundreds or even thousands of times brighter. Now this does not hurt the white dwarf star. So it'll give off a burst of energy become a lot brighter and then it will begin accreting material again. So this can happen multiple times in the same system as long as material is being transferred from one star to another. So a nova can be recurring. Now we can also have a supernova. This process is exactly the same as a nova. The only difference is the question what happens if this mass transfer pushes the mass of the white dwarf over that 1.4 solar mass limit. Remember once you get over 1.4 solar masses that star can no longer support itself against gravity and will collapse and it will start to compress down igniting all of the carbon within the star and and it won't just begin at the center it'll begin throughout the entire star altogether and will then tear itself apart so that entire star will rip itself apart so here's an example showing what happens we have two stars here one star here they're both on the main sequence here the first star has evolved to become a red giant and not much happens. You might get mass transfer between the two, but that's not a necessity. Then this star will become a white dwarf. When the second star evolves and becomes a red dwarf, it'll start the matter transfer onto the white dwarf star. And if this star is very close to that 1.4 solar mass limit, it will push it over, ignite the carbon, we call a carbon detonation supernova, and it will just rip itself apart. And there will be nothing left behind of this star. It'll tear itself apart completely. And it's all because it pushed itself over that 1.4 solar mass limit. One too many objects that it could just not hold up against. So we talked now about two types of supernovae. We talked previously about the type 2 supernova, which is the explosion of a massive star at the end of its life. That leaves behind either a neutron star or a black hole, depending on the mass of the remnant. When we look at these, we see strong hydrogen lines in the spectrum. That's a way to be able to identify them when we see a supernova. Just seeing a star brighten doesn't tell us which of these two types it is. But if we take a spectrum, if we see strong hydrogen lines, that means it is, it is a type 2 and a star, massive star at the end of its life. A type 1 supernova is a white dwarf star that exceeds that 1.4 solar mass limit and explodes, leaving nothing behind. This has no hydrogen lines. Remember what exploded. It was a big ball of carbon detonating and exploding outward and will not have significant quantities of hydrogen. 
These types of supernova are extremely important for distances. Remember our distance ladder and we will come back to that with galaxies. These supernovae are going to be important because they are examples of standard candles. They have a standard brightness. Why? Every single one of these is the exact same type of object that explodes. They are all white dwarf stars and they all have a mass of 1.4 solar masses exactly the same. Whereas a type 2 supernova, the mass might have been 20 solar masses or 30 solar masses or 40 solar masses, they'll all have different brightnesses. These are all identical and we'll see them again when we look at determining distances. So though those are two things that can happen with a white dwarf star. How about a neutron star? What can a neutron star do? What if instead of a white dwarf, we had a neutron star in a binary system? Well, the exact same thing as we looked at for a nova could happen here. You could transfer mass from a companion just like we did to the white dwarf. Material would build up on its surface just like it did on the white dwarf. The difference is that gravity is much stronger and temperatures are much higher. So instead of getting bursts of visible light, we get bursts of x-rays from the surface. In fact, many x-ray bursts have been detected. So we've detected many of these and it is the same process as a nova. It is just a nova instead of being a white dwarf. It is a neutron star at the center here. And that is what is collecting the material and its increased gravity and increased temperatures will cause it to undergo a burst of energy from its surface. Now, depending on how these happen, depending on the position, you also can use this to speed up neutron star rotation. So if the material is spiraling in one direction and the neutron star is rotating that same direction, you're giving it a little kick each time material hits it. It's hitting it in the same direction, like pushing a child on a swing. You push them when they're going in the right direction and you can accelerate them upward. Well, this can accelerate pulsars to millisecond pulsars where they can be spinning 100 to 100 times a second up to almost the limit. Even a neutron star has a limit to how fast it can spin before it would rip itself apart. Now the last thing we wanted to look at here are the gamma ray bursts. Gamma rays, the most intense electromagnetic energy, and the gamma ray bursts were actually detected by the military in the 1960s. Why would the military detect them? Well, gamma ray bursts, uh, bursts of gamma rays are associated with nuclear explosions. So tests, uh, tests from nuclear detonations on Earth uh, were being looked for as to who was giving off to testing nuclear weapons and they were actually looking for those and they found gamma rays from the sky and now we know of thousands of those and it's difficult to pinpoint their location so it's very hard to see exactly where they are because that which makes it hard to identify an optical or a radio counterpart. So we can't, it's hard to find the object. It took a long time for this because gamma ray telescopes have very poor resolution. Now you might think if you remember resolution, short wavelengths give you a really high resolution and gamma rays are among the shortest wavelengths. However, gamma rays are impossible to focus. So even though you can even though they would have a high resolution theoretically because of that, since you cannot focus them, they are unable to take advantage of that resolution. We have now been able to identify optical sources for some of these and many of them are billions of light years away. So these are nothing anywhere nearby us that we are detecting. Now when we look at the gamma ray bursts, we split them into two groups. There are two types of, of gamma ray bursts. There are long duration and short duration bursts. Now the cutoff there is set at two seconds. So a long duration burst just means it lasts longer than two seconds. We believe this is caused by a stellar collapse of a star that lost its outer layers of hydrogen. Now when it does that, when it collapses down, material then expels outward through this. All the gamma rays come out because it has less material to shield it from that. So instead of this happening well below in the core, now you have an exposed core where material is accelerating outward 
and that material can then be uh, emitted as gamma rays and we can detect these as the long duration bursts which may only be a few seconds but at least two seconds in length. Now the short duration bursts on the other hand are believed to be or first of all are less than two seconds in length. These are believed to be caused by neutron stars. We sometimes call this a kilonova. And that is from merging neutron stars as they spiral in together and will eventually release gravitational waves as they combine and coalesce. And if you remember from the explosion that we get here, when we looked at what elements form, a lot of the elements, heavier elements, are for, often formed in collisions of neutron stars such as we talk about here. So those short duration gamma ray bursts can also produce a lot of the elements that we see in the universe. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary. And what we've looked at here is that compact stars in a binary system give rise to many different things. A white dwarf can become a nova or a supernova depending on the exact conditions, while neutron stars become x-ray or gamma ray bursters. So that concludes this lecture on compact stars and binary systems. We'll be back again next time for another topic in astronomy. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.